Good afternoon. Happy Sunday. Uh, lived Black experience community, friends, family, supporters, wherever you are. Thank you so much for joining us today uh, for our June uh, book club discussion. We um, experienced a little technical difficulties. Um, I think that was last weekend, last Sunday, or the Sunday before. And so we said that we would come uh, to you today with our June book club uh, discussion. Today, we're going to discuss two books. Uh, Sister Dr. Margaret Boatwright, who is our book club discussion leader. Um, our books for this month were The Song of Solomon by, uh, by the, the Empress herself, uh, Dr. Toni Morrison. And then we also read um, The Immortal Life of Henrietta, Henrietta Lacks. And so I'm excited because Sister Dr. Margaret is going to kind of discuss some parallels between the stories. And, you know, keep in mind, we talk about the lived Black experience here and the books that we're reading are about uh, our experiences, whether they are fiction or nonfiction. And, and the fiction, um, many of us can, can relate and because they are stories that perhaps we know of some family members or some people in our communities who are um, of African descent have, have experienced some of these same um, uh, tragedies, triumphs that, that are in these works of fiction. So today, um, one book is a fiction. Uh, the Song of Solomon, but in my reading, um, it's 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 sort of I can point out I can see and know of stories in real life um, about the character and 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 his challenges, and then the story of Henrietta Henrietta Lacks, a very 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 true story. And so I'm not going to give it all away. I'm going to let Sister Dr. Margaret uh, take us through this discussion. But before we get started, um, of course we have to give a shout out uh, to Bright Side Bookshop here in Flagstaff. And um, I, I love their slogan, local, independent, yours. And so we're very grateful to them for partnering with um, the Southside Community Association, um, which the Lived Black Experience Project uh, sits under. And so they are carrying all of these book titles that we're covering. So please be sure to support them. You can, they have a wonderful website. You can order the books from no matter where you are uh, just to, to, to support them because supporting them um, is supporting also this lived black experience project. So I'm going to welcome our sister, Dr. Uh, Margaret, how are you today? I am good. How are you? I am well. I'm excited um, to hear um, your 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 thoughts on on these two very different books and how you're going to lead us in this discussion that's going to pull both of the stories together in in this topic of our lived black experience. So thank you for being here. I see that uh, you're inside staying cool today. It is hot, hot outside. <laughs> Same thing here. Yesterday, we actually clocked up to 103 degrees. Oh, wow. There's yeah. no getting away. Yeah, we, I was like, oh my goodness, where am I? So today it's 91. 
I'm indoors as well, but it, and it, but today it's strange. It, it feels much cooler uh, than it did yesterday. So we give praises for the indoors, uh, for you having air conditioning, for the engineers and architects who build houses here in Flagstaff that do not need air conditionings and the houses miraculously stay cool. So all praises to all praises. technology <laughs> and science. <Thank> you. <laughs> Because we, I don't know how the people who lived here without those amenities, I don't, I can't imagine how they did it. The, that's true. But then the other thing we have to add to that is before, that was before global warming. That's true. Yeah. So the days didn't feel as excruciatingly hot as they do now in this present time. That's so true. yeah, we, thank you for all of um our viewers, thank you for joining us. And as always, we invite you to add comments, um, to ask questions. And um, here we go. Thank you so much. And uh, the camera's yours. All right. Well, thank you. And I so appreciate the um, introduction of the topic this afternoon and really recognizing that we have so many connections. And as we read these topics and we read about the characters in the books, whether they be fiction or nonfiction, it's so easy to draw on people that we know or experiences that we've had ourselves and, and get some deeper understanding that way. Um, reading Song of Solomon along with the immortal life of Henrietta Lacks, I was really shocked and surprised at my own shock of the number of times that I found commonality between the books and how fiction uh, often um, can recreate or um, give details of real life and how some of these things go hand in hand. And also just thinking about the era that Song of Solomon was written in um, and that being reflective of the same era that the whole Henrietta Lacks episode went down. Um, in addition to that, just kind of thinking about some of my own connections with Toni Morrison is um, when I read her stuff, her novels, I often put myself or I feel like I can see a lot of the, the characters through her eyes or how she would experience them, mainly because um, she and I share a hometown. We're both from Lorain, Ohio. And so I was blessed to have an opportunity to meet with her. I can't remember exactly what year. I think it was maybe 1996 that Miss Morrison came through Flagstaff and um, met with students and did some presentations about a book that she had written Paradise at that time. And so I had this really unique opportunity to meet with her. It was kind of funny because when she got into Flagstaff, um, it, they made it very well known that Miss Morrison will not be autographing books, so don't ask. And so when you got in line to greet her, you were reminded multiple times as you approached the table where she was sitting, don't ask. Um, and so I was able to make it up to the table and established our commonality of background and have that pleasant exchange with her and then went on to listen to her talk. And it just so happened, and this was probably in March or April that she was in Flagstaff, and there was this horrible blizzard that um, happened overnight while she was in town. And so I got a phone call at about five o'clock that next morning saying that they were looking for somebody to drive Miss Morrison from Flagstaff down to Phoenix to the airport um, because the person who originally had signed up to volunteer was no longer available. So I was like, this is my opportunity. I'm going to pack up my book and I'm getting this autograph. Um, and just the blessing, though, of being able to spend that two and a half, actually more than two and a half hours of a drive from Flagstaff down to Phoenix was incredible. And she is a, was a bit of an intimidating woman. So as forward as I have found myself being and asking for things and advocating for myself, I figured it out right away that I was not going to be getting an autograph from Miss Morrison. So I saved myself the aggravation and didn't even ask. Um, it was interesting too, in the um, university van that I was driving, it was a big van, like a 16 passenger van. It was Ms. Morrison and her assistant. And there was this huge placard, no smoking. Um, and when she lit up her cigarette, that's pretty much when I knew 
I'm not asking her for nothing because Miss Morrison is in charge and she gets what she wants and she does what she wants. And she was so pleasant and it was great speaking with her. Um, and just even she mentioned something about eating a piece of corn and the way she described that piece of corn just had me eating corn driving through a blizzard. So anyways, um, when I read her, um, I read it with that kind of understanding of maybe where she's coming from just geographically, and then with a little bit of my understanding of spending a little bit of time with her. So enough about that. I definitely want to jump in to the content of these books. Um, and the way that I want to present them this month is a little bit different than what I've done in the past, kind of talking about the plot and then what happened next and who's who. Um, I really wanted to just more this time focus on some of those common themes and common concepts that came through reading both of these stories um, at the same time. One really big theme that jumped out to me um, for both of them was just kind of knowing the story. Um, there was a portion in chapter three where Macon, who is one of the supporting characters, the main character is Milkman. And so he's having a conversation with his son and he's trying to give him that coming of age conversation. And he makes a comment to his son. Um, and the, the statement he says is to be a whole man, you have to deal with the whole truth. And then Macon goes on to give Milkman some details about um, the relationship that he's had with Milkman's mother and some other details and family history um, that kind of explain in the dad's colorful and maybe one-sided explanation of um, his mother's, of Milkman's mother's relationship with her father and how unhealthy he thought that relationship was. Um, when I think about that, and in the context of Henrietta Lacks, the whole book, Henrietta Lacks, um, it focuses on how the cells from Henrietta Lacks's cancer tumors um, had been taken and grown and um, used in extensive research um, and have become famous in the science world um, and instrumental in a lot of medical discoveries and medical treatments and, and those kinds of things. But the real meat and potatoes of the story is really circled or centered around Henrietta Lacks's daughter and her quest to develop an understanding of who her mother is and who her family is and what that background is. And so the story really talks about her desire to get to know her mother as a person rather than as a group of cells. Um, it's her desire to get to know herself um, by knowing instances and, and details of her mother's life. And then it, there's also a part of the story where she's so desperate to understand the background and history as it relates to her younger sister who had some developmental delays or disabilities and was placed in a home. And her disappointment in for the a majority of her younger life, not even knowing that she had a younger sister. And by the time she found out that she had a sister, her sister had already died. So just that quest of really identifying who you are um, and knowing who you are through researching and understanding your history. And so both the, of the books really had that um, main concept as the underlying concept that really drove the development of each of the stories. Um, another um, big feature that stood out to me in both of the books is the importance of our names. And so back to Song of Solomon, there's a chapter, it's actually chapter three, where um, Milkman, the main character, is having a conversation with his childhood friend, um, who is, his nickname is Guitar. Um, and they're talking about the importance of names. And so in their conversation, Guitar has more of an understanding that, or a belief that, you know, people should get their names in more traditional means, that your name should have a meaning, maybe it would be handed down through your family, or maybe your mother and father would sit down and have a conversation about names that they like, and they would be very methodical in picking out names that, you know, represented the family. Um, really, what Milkman's conception was, was more in line with the white population and how 
generally or traditionally white families would pick out names. Um, Guitar, on the other hand, had a different vision or opinion about the meaning of names and how people should get their names. And he pointed out in the conversation that a lot of black people get their names um, just the best way that they could. So Milkman's last name happened to be dead. And so when the story evolves and we, you get that background understanding of how the family's last name could become dead, it really went back to the fact that when Milkman's grandfather went to register, um, he encountered a drunken white man um, and they had a conversation and were trying to kind of come up with some name. And the question came up, well, where's your father? And Milkman's grandfather's response was, my father's dead. And so that became the last name. So really um, what Guitar is saying is, black people get their, their names the best way they can under the circumstances. So it could be just through happenstance and conversation and okay, well then we'll just use that as your last name. Um, but also he mentioned how people get nicknames. It could be representative of something that they like or something that they do well. But regardless, Guitar's explanation was black people get their names the best way they can and they derive meaning, but also that uh, when black people get their names, it doesn't really matter. Um, and it really becomes more of a reflection of establishing their own identity, even in the midst of less than, than friendly circumstances or um, even in the midst of oppression. Um, when I carry that concept over to the story of Henrietta Lacks, um, we have to understand that the name of her cells was given um, as Gila, which represented the first two letters of her first name and then the first two letters of her last name, just to create that sense of anonymity as far as, you know, this is a medical procedure. We don't want to give out a person's name. Um, we'll just kind of use this code to give the, this name to cells. But in the process of that, um, her cells, um, again, just went on to be world renowned, shot into space um, and done all kinds of unimaginable things with, um, but her name, her personal name was detached or removed from the cells. And there's a part in the book that talks about how doctors prefer to detach a person's name from the cells because then they don't really have to think about the cells as belonging to a person. And so it, it somewhat dehumanizes that person. Um, but then as you follow, um, Deborah through her journey to find out about the history of her mother and the history of her mother's cells and how they became to be so famous and so important in science, she made it very clear up front. The first thing that we need to get straight is you're going to get my mother's name right. At least make sure that you get her name right. There are a couple times in the story where other possible names were um, lifted in in place of people really weren't sure what the original name of the person that the cells were taken from. Um, so the name Helen um, was used a couple times um, and Hen Helen Locks or something like that. Um, but it was really troublesome for Deborah to, to know that her mother was not getting the recognition that she deserved because people weren't even using her name correctly in reference to her cells. Um, jumping back to Song of Solomon, um, they also, at the end of the story, after um, Milkman gets the information that he really needs to understand his background and his family history, um, he is driving through this town where his family originated or where his grandfather um, had spent a significant amount of his time growing up. Um, and he now has this revelation about who his family is and what his family name actually means. And then he reflects back on his aunt, whose name is Pilot. Um, and understanding that Pilot's name was chosen by the, his grandfather, which would be Pilot's father, who happened to be illiterate. And the way that he chose her name was just to open the Bible and point to a name or find the closest name to wherever he opened the Bible. And there was the name. So Pilot of all names was the name given to his daughter. Um, but he didn't know how to read. So he had to have somebody um, help him to determine what the name of his child was gonna be even following that family ritual of choosing names. 
Um, and so it says in Song of Solomon that Pilate, he copied it to the best of his ability on a small piece of paper and folded it up. And so Pilate eventually got that piece of paper folded up into a very small piece and it was placed into, I guess, what was maybe a capsule. And later in life, she had that capsule made into an earring that she always wore on her ear um, all the time. And so as um, Milkman is driving through town and looking at signs in a different way and understanding names in a different way, he makes this statement, which I thought was really important. It says, names had meaning. No wonder Pilate put hers in her ear. When you know your name, you should hang on to it. For unless it is noted down and remembered, it will die when you do. And so I, I saw, I just felt the, the strength and the importance in that statement. And as that related also to Henrietta Lacks and Deborah's um, determination to make sure that her mother's name be known, because if her mother's name isn't known and, and it isn't spoken, that it would die along with her. Um, another point that stood out to me as important or prominent in the story has to do with, let me find my note here, um, mental illness, actually. Um, and so because mental illness is evident in both of the books, um, we see mental illness in Lena. Lena is Pilate's daughter, so would actually be Milkman's cousin, who he actually had a romantic relationship with, and she did not take the breakup very well. And you hear, and there's not a whole lot of details about Lena's upbringing or her mental state up until the end of her life, where she starts dealing with the breakup between herself and Milkman very terribly, um, to the extent where she is making these ill-conceived attempts to murder him. Um, and then eventually she takes her own life. But you, as you're reading the story, you see how mental illness really starts to take over and she really starts to spiral down um, and has kind of a manic episode um, and then just kind of slips into a depression. Um, but definitely the people around her had not having the tools to intervene or assist her, um, just using the best tools that they have to, to accommodate her and to, to keep her comfortable um, during her last days. Um, as Deborah in the Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks is telling her story, even in the very beginning of the story, she talks about her difficulties with anxiety and her struggles with depression as well. Um, and that becomes evident as she is going through that painful process of gathering details about the um, experience that her mother had. She has access to the medical records. She reads about the autopsy um, and reads all those statements that are really not um, they would not be pleasant. They're just very blunt and very frank when they are written in medical records and, and autopsy reports like that. Um, so just being exposed to that information on top of the fact that she has known mental illness that she's dealing with and has taken medication for and things like that. Um, the book just kind of demonstrates how that is something that occurs in the African-American population as well as in the population at large. Um, even keeping it in context where, you know, we don't really talk about these kinds of things and, and mental illness within our families. A lot of times it's something that we know it's there, we know it exists, and we would just try to do the best that we can, but maybe not necessarily talk about it, um, not necessarily seek help for it. Um, so just kind of looking at the the evidence of mental illness in both of the, the stories was, was striking to me. Um, in Deborah's case, particularly, I thought about how her experience with death and especially the, the passing of her mother must have been and obviously was so striking to her and had such a huge impact on her life. And the story, um, the novel, the, the, the book talks about how at when her mother died, it was just like she never existed. So there were no conversations about her. She didn't know what her mother's favorite color was or what her mother liked to do. Um, so she just didn't have that 
information, but she had that. And so I think that was part of why she had that craving for information, just to fill in some of those blanks regarding her mother's existence and just acknowledging that she was human, that, that, that she was a part of the family. Um, but because of the way that her family dealt with the death, um, she really didn't have opportunities to go through the normal grieving process that many people have to go through. So as I read that part of the book, it really made me think of how complicated her experience was with grief in the fact that one, she was very young when her mother died. Two, there were really no opportunities for her to have outlets or, you know, that go through any of the natural grieving process because there weren't even opportunities for her to speak of her mother or gain the information that she so desperately wanted. Um, there was a part in the book where she was acquainted. She met one of the scientists that studied her mother's cells and was given an opportunity to meet her mother's cells in a sense. And so she took one of her brothers with her and they were able to look at the cells through a microscope. Um, and she actually was given a, a picture blown up of the cells with fluorescent colors on it. And she was able to say how beautiful the cells were. Um, and so I, when I read that part of the book, it really felt like she was able to, it was memorial. It was a memorial type of an experience for her and her brother to be in the presence of their mother, or at least in her, in the presence of her living cells. Um, and to really experience some of the normal mourning and grief process that we that she really missed out on as part of her childhood. So obviously, since the time of her mother's death, there's been a lot more research about death and dying and the grieving process. But just understanding that her grieving process was complicated, and there's a, a term complicated grief by the fact that the way that she found out that her mother's cancer cells were even still in existence. Um, a big premise of the story of the immortal life of Henrietta Lacks is her Henrietta Lacks's cells were so important to medical history, yet the family had no idea for over 20 years that her cells were still alive and even existed in laboratory and had been studied so extensively. Um, so there are parts of the book that talk about how racism um, came into play and not really notifying the family or receiving the proper um, consent to collect her cells um, and then continue to utilize them in research. Um, but still just the, the idea that, you know, we have a, a woman who never got to mourn the passing of her mother in a normal type of fashion, um, and then being confronted over time um, with the fact that there were some secrets surrounding her mother's death, so to speak, about those cells that were continuing to live in spite of her mother's death. Um, and then the re repeated exposure to trauma that she experienced when people became aware, even the way that she found out was very casual. It was Deborah's daughter-in-law went to have lunch at a friend's house and was having a conversation with the friend's brother-in-law, I believe, who happened to work at the hospital um, and was doing research with the cells. And so she mentioned that her last name was Lex and the brother-in-law said, oh, well, how interesting the cells that I'm researching are from Henrietta Lex. And so just a uh, lunch conversation with a stranger across the table, um, and that conversation was with Henrietta Lacks's daughter-in-law, was how the family found out that her cells were even in existence at that time. So taking that information back to the family, and again, just um, empathizing with Deborah of then having kind of to re-experience her trauma of the passing of her mother, um, and then being taken advantage of and exploited by a few people over the, the course of the book. They talk about how other people came in and made promises about getting some things done or lawsuits or things like that, that all ended in disappointment for her. So again, just that the revisiting of the trauma of the passing of her mother. Another thing um, regarding Deborah and her mental illness that stood out to me was that just her experience of childhood trauma. Um, and of recent years, there have been considerable studies about the impact of adverse childhood experiences, which are referred to as ACEs, and how they can lead to 
negative life outcomes, which include poor mental health and poor physical health. And so there's actually this, uh, the ACEs test. So it's the trauma and adverse childhood experiences assessment that asks questions, um, 10 different questions. And the more answers yes that you produce on this test, the more likely you are then to have those negative or adverse effects into your adulthood. So when I apply um, Deborah Lax's childhood experience with, um, she was exposed to physical abuse. She was exposed to sexual abuse. She lost a parent at an early age. Um, and there was another one. There was um, emotional neglect was a possibility for her. Um, and the research shows that people who have four or more of these ACEs or four or more of these indicators are significantly more likely to have mental health and physical health issues um, later on in life, especially if those indicators go unresolved um, in a child's life. And, and it's usually when any of these indicators um, are present in a person's life at age 18 or younger, so in their childhood. Um, so those were just kind of the interesting points that I wanted to bring to light about the stories and or the books and and the commonality that they they shared and and some of the important things that I thought would be worthy of conversation this afternoon. Awesome. <clears throat> I I um Miss Deb, our community chief is um just jumping right in. Um, talks about, she makes a comment about um, how she made the decision to crown her son um, with a family name, um, which is for, um, from an uncle and, and grandfather and great grandfather and great, great, great grandfather. And, um, and it's culturally, you know, that's that's typically what we do. But I have known of stories and, and so we, we mentioned this early on about um how these supposed nonfiction stories, we we know of true stories in our culture or in our family. And so when when we look at pilot. Um, the first time that I read that book, um, cause I, I'm fascinated by names and, and it is so true. Names really crown us with who we are and speak to our family ancestry and lineage and culture, and maybe even what we do, hammers and like Hammers, like a man who, whose last name, surname would be Hammer. But Pilate in the Bible, so the father, and help me if I'm wrong, so the father just points to this name and it happens to be Pilate, which in the Bible is Pontius Pilate, who happens to be the judge of Yeshua, um, he presided over Yeshua's trial and, and was the one who, who made the judgment, we shall crucify him. Do you think that Pilate, do, you, do we see any similarities of judgment of, of being in those positions of presiding over is that personality evident in in Pilate in Song of Solomon? That's a great question I had not thought of. You know, let me think this one through and you can talk it through with me too. She seems, you know, when Milkman first meets her, she's kind of like the forbidden, don't go over there. Um, because the relationship between Pilate and her brother, Macon, is strained. They haven't mm -hmm. spoken since they were kids. Um, and so, and they haven't even been in each other's presence for many years. So mm -hmm. then suddenly Pilate moves into the same town that Macon and his family move in, have lived in. He seems to be a bit embarrassed by her and her chosen 
vocation, which she mm -hmm. just sells wine. I don't know if it's moonshine, but it's wine. Um, yep. And they the the part of the story where Milkman goes to that place to meet her, I don't even think he realized that they were related, did he? I don't think so, not right off. I don't think that I don't he think so. did, but yeah. there was there's something very whimsical about her, very magical about her, kind of omniscient, omniscient, you know, like very knowledgeable and wise. Um, even the way that, and I don't remember all the details about their first encounter where she just kind of, it's, she doesn't speak to him in riddle, but it's very, um, I don't, I don't have a word, um, cryptic. Um, yeah. And so there is that wisdom. I don't see her as judgmental though. I don't, I can't think of anything that makes me think that she's judgmental in spite of the fact that she was not a fan of her brother. When right. she did come to town, she helped her sister-in-law who wanted desperately to conceive a child. And so right. she was compassionate to her and kind of got in and, you know, here's, here's a potion. It'll help. It'll um, help yeah. I don't really see her. I see her as being a teacher and really exposing Milkman to a different way of life where it seems that his parents really are, they wanna fit in with the mainstream white culture. And so when he meets Pilot, he, he sees the other side and right. then starts to develop that interest in his own family history. But I don't, I can't think of anything that would make me think that she would be more like that taking on that judging position. But, could we agree, you know, judges have to have that ability to, to see both sides and not lean to one or the other. True, I like that. Type of wisdom. Wisdom, and yes. So maybe, the, and so when I, I saw, I realized I said judgmental, not judgmental, but those qualities that a judge has to have. Mm -hmm. um, do we think that we see that coming through Pilot um, as the sister in, in, in this story? I feel like I want to say yes. You know, I, I think that when you look at her in contrast to her brother, he never wanted to give up the grudge. Whatever yeah. happened in that cave, he was not over it. He was not going to get over it. And she came, you know, away from it like, I still want to be your family. Yeah. I still want to be a part of your life. And so I think her ability to look at that situation between them in the bigger scope of really the two of them were all that each other had. And so because the, they had no other family to rely upon. That's so I, I, I really did see her wisdom. And I, I feel like Milkman appreciated her wisdom, too. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, another shared theme that you brought up, um, both stories, um, which and the reason why we do we do this project, talking about racism and discrimination um in reading the story of of sister lax um it brought to memory are you familiar with um the situation that serena williams endured um in the hospital after she delivered her daughter no Where what happened well, she needed, and, and I don't want to, I'm just going to kind of generalize it. Um, there was some sort of medication in the form of, a, of a, a shot that she needed, and she was denied it hmm. uh, three times, and three times she kept asking, um, and, and, and finally under a lot of protests and we we are all some of most of us are very familiar with Serena's temper mm -hmm. so I think she had to get to that point in order to demand that she receive uh, the type of medical attention um, that typically 
a normal patient would receive. And so she really brought attention to how um, black women um, and when they're um, having to depend on medical um, professionals aren't always treated uh, with, with the same respect or consideration as our brothers and sisters who do not look like us. And yeah. so I thought, and so it made me go back because the, you know, the Lax book came out before Serena just had her daughter just a few short years ago, mm -hmm. but it made me go back and reflect on the Lax story. Um, and you being, you know, working, I guess, some, I would think, so a little closely with the medical profession. Is this something that we're still dealing with? Oh, absolutely. I mean, um, there was, and I don't remember this doctor's name, but she, it had to do with COVID and, and we can talk about COVID too and how, you know, the chances of you surviving COVID as an African-American was significantly lower um, depending on who you were, where you were, it could really predict the level of treatment that you would get. There was a woman, a female doctor, and she started recording herself. I should look up her name. Um, oh, and I, I think, remember that story. Yeah, on Facebook. Did she and ultimately so she, pass away? She did. Yeah. She did. So she's intelligent. She's a trained medical professional. She's a doctor. She has COVID. She's in the hospital saying, I know what I need and you need to give it to me. And she couldn't get it. And she died. Right. Is it happening? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Absolutely. Yes, it is. And yeah. And, but and do the, you the, think, so did the lack story, I mean, you know, so we write and we tell these stories to bring it to light to call attention to it. Um, let's see. So the Lax, uh, Henrietta Lax story came out, I guess it's been what, at least six years ago? Yeah, let me look. It's not, it's fairly new. Yeah. Of course it's not here. 2010, it won an award. Okay, so 11 years ago. Yeah. And and so since then, so we have Serena having to get loud <laughs> and <laughs> protest, you know, from the maternity ward. Mm -hmm. And then now we have this doctor um who the same thing we're talking about racism and discrimination mm -hmm. um, in in the medical care profession yeah and even it's in both of these books because at the very opening scene of song of solomon That's it's right. talking about the fact that black babies were not born in this hospital it just so happened that Mom went into labor, her father was a doctor, and they just kind of let that happen. Yeah. But that Jim Crow separation of medical, you know, access to medical care um, was very evident in, in the beginning of Song of Solomon. Um, and the Henrietta Lacks book also really gives a lot of history about the mistrust that African-Americans have of yes. the medical community. Um, yeah. And so they talk also about, we could go to the hospital, but we had to go in this entrance. Uh, we knew that we weren't gonna get the best of everything, but at least we were getting something. Um, right. So yeah, just a lot of background and explanation about the history of the mistrust. And it's, it's not only history of mistrust, but it's the presence of mistrust. Like I wanna be able mm -hmm. to go somewhere and know that I'm just gonna get the care that I need, not based on who I am or what I represent to you. And see, that I think is what is scary today. So to now we don't have the hospital for whites only, and this over here is the Negro hospital. Now we can all go to the same hospital. And so you just have to trust that you're being given the medication that 
the doctor is prescribing or trust that the doctor is going to even prescribe the exact medication that you need, which was Serena Williams's story. Mm -hmm. And you know, God forbid if it goes beyond, well, you got the ethical doctor, but the nurse who dispenses the medication doesn't follow through. And who mm -hmm. could easily report, oh, yes, the patient received this. And it, it's, you know, so these are our experiences. Yes, it makes us very um, vulnerable to all of the different hands that need to be involved in the pot. And I, I remember when I chose my um, gynecologist when I was pregnant, I was like, I want a black doctor female and I found one and I love her, but she wasn't there to take care of me the whole time. And I experienced some maltreatment from a white nurse too. And it was just disappointing. They wouldn't do it in her presence, but you know, it was there. And how long ago was this that you delivered your child? Eight and a half years. See? <laughs> so, you know, I mean, we're not here talking about something that happened 20, 30, 40, yeah. 50 years ago. Right. Um, so the, the history of mistrust is actually the presence of mistrust because mistrust, there's still yes. a lot of evidence to support the fact that you can't just assume that you're going to get the best medical treatment available. Exactly. And, and I think if anything, um, you know, that I'd want our uh, LBE book club viewers to to know or to take away from from these two stories um, is that um, and and all of the the books that we will cover in 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 this project is that he, the fiction we could come back and, and give you real life incidents. And the nonfiction, um, we, we want to, we do this to educate, inform and enlighten others. And so these are points of reference that people can use um, it, to, to help you know, substantiate <laughs> what the lived Black experience is all about. Yeah, I think there's something in the collective experience that helps to validate your own experience. You know, yeah. I am not a unicorn and, and I don't feel out of place as if I know that I'm not the only one who's having this experience that I'm having. It's problematic. Right. It would it would make me feel better in the bigger scope that this is not unusual. I want to believe that it's not unusual, but the fact that it is unusual, I think, is something worth talking about so that when people have these experiences, they understand some background and some of the basis of where their own experience is coming from, rather than believing that maybe something is their own fault. Exactly. Yeah. And so with you being in the profession that you're in, can you, you know, as we come to the end of this discussion, um, how, can you give us any advice on how to advocate for ourselves when, when we are in these situations. I mean, you, you shared and, and thank you for, for being open and willing to, to share that you have had this experience, you know, in, in less than 10 years ago. Um, how, how can we advocate for ourselves if we don't have a family member with us at that very time or even not at all? when we're going through these uh, medical experiences? That's a really tough question, um, but there's gotta be something. I mean, first of all, understanding that as much as possible, having that inner strength and understanding, even having the general understanding that it could possibly happen, I think is just equipping yourself to know. And I don't want people to be hyper vigilant and think that every time something happens, oh my goodness, this is it and I'm going off right now. But just to have an awareness so that if something starts to not seem right, then 
you need to start moving forward with some executing some kind of plan. Um, I think at the first sign of feeling uncomfortable about things, it's, let me, it's my mommy. <laughs> um, when you and trust your instincts, I think is another thing because a lot of times it's those subtle things that just kind of make you raise an eyebrow um, mm -hmm. and trust those instincts and, and let your instincts lead you. Um, you know, the good news is we do have access to technology and cell phones. So if we need to call somebody in and help us in a situation, um, then by all means, get on the phone, call. I, I could have called my doctor. I could have done a lot of things. Um, realizing that sometimes we have that fight or flight response and mm -hmm. sometimes it's just flight and you may be paralyzed at the moment and can't do anything but don't beat yourself up and don't feel like you've lost an opportunity to go back and address something, you know, just because you're dismissed from the hospital or released doesn't mean that you don't have the right to go back and have some conversations and let some things be known. So really just, you know, not being so hard on yourself and feeling like you missed an opportunity just because it might be a little bit after the fact. Yeah. And, and, and may I add to that? I, I, I was pre-med before I got into um, business and divinity. So, but, you know, my uncle would always remind me because he was from that generation that did not trust doctors. Um, you know, he'd say doctors practice. So they don't really know. So you better be studying along with the doctor. Mm -hmm. and, and and I, he, what he was saying is true that we should also uh, study and research and question um, the doctor. And before we sign off on yes to the surgeries or the different procedures, I think sometimes we just sign, they tell us, okay, just sign here. Mm -hmm. And we not take the time to read um, what we've signed off on. Like mm -hmm. with the anesthesia, we've just, we, we didn't read it. We just signed off on the fact that you could die and <laughs> to, to acknowledge that, you know, this is what anesthesia does and you mm -hmm. may not wake up, but yet we just sign it. It's and, like buying a house. You just sign it. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, we we need to we need to interview the doctors. Um, you know, see what their track record has been like. Mm -hmm. um, you know, who how many survived? How many? You know, how many are there? Any lawsuits against against mm -hmm. you know this prospective medical provider? So we've got to take some responsibility um you know and just like we we get to know people and they earn our trust mm -hmm. we i think we have to do the same thing with our medical providers as well right i think also i think that's great advice and good insight i think also um it's so easy to feel overwhelmed it, when we start talking about medical stuff, like I'm not trained, I don't know. And so you want to trust. Um, and so it makes it difficult to even feel empowered to ask a question. Um, so really doing some of that legwork and having some conversations. Um, and even in situations where you might not have family here, but I would say, don't go alone. You know, and that's what Miss Deb is saying now. She just posted that she would suggest at any time you have a medical situation that, if at all possible, have someone with you. Mm -hmm. And then for people who live in an area like she and I were here in Flagstaff, that there may be fewer Black people. You do need to to have someone um, along with you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, don't go alone yeah. um, because yeah. you might be incapacitated and not able to advocate for yourself. Right, right, mm -hmm. right, right, right. Well, and it just goes to show that we can learn a lot from 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 these nonfiction stories, and they tell our stories uh, in real life. 
and then thank goodness for for stories for the people who are writing uh, the history of um, people like Henrietta Lacks who helped forward um, you know medical research. Mm -hmm. So she's a heroine as far as I'm concerned. She um, is. Yeah, and, and a lot of people do not know her. So that's another reason why we we chose to, to share her story. Mm -hmm. um, we're getting a comment from one of our big, big uh, supporters um, and, and cheerleaders, uh, Miss Finger. And she's saying, my job as a Euro-American is to believe you and not say you're just too sensitive or that you're making this up or make excuses for the medical person. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, this is why we do this project. We want to, to have more people like Miss Finger that get this and why yeah. we're, this is why we're doing this. And that's the response. That's the mindset that we're trying to get our brothers and sisters to, to be in that do not look like us. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's yeah. the work that we are in, endeavoring to do. Exactly. Exactly. To, you know, we're not doing this to point fingers or to make anyone feel bad. It's to tell the story and change the narrative. Mm-hmm. That's all. It's it's exactly. not a matter. We're not going back and talking about the doctor who was responsible for for Miss Lax and in doing in doing this. Uh, you know, it's it's really not all that important. What's important is that this happened, mm -hmm. and and how can we avoid this in future generations? And and that interestingly, as I was reading that that book, that's where the family is too. You know, they, um, some conversations about money and, you know, who's made millions and billions of dollars have been made mm -hmm. on this. But in the end, her children, even the ones that were kind of trying to pursue some financial gains said, really in the end, we just want our mother to get the recognition that she deserves. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. 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 Well, do you want to reveal what are we reading? We're in July already. So what I'm are behind. We... <laughs> I, I, you know what? I don't know. <laughs> tell me. I was hoping that you would tell me what I'm reading. Is I right. don't have and I feel bad. I don't have I'm not at my desk. I don't have my list with me. But uh, when we come back, we'll be back um, with another live stream on um, Wednesday. And so we'll make sure that we announce um, what we're reading and um, get everyone ready for, for, for our next uh, book club um, discussion, which I think would be on, I'm looking at my calendar now, on the 25th. Okay. So we still have time to to delve in and to read and to get our books from, um, again, uh, Brightside Bookshop. Um, but this weather certainly wants you to just stay in and be cool and read a book. Read a <laughs> so, book and, and next month I will be tuning in from sunny Lorraine, Ohio. How about this that? Month, this month, yeah. Oh my goodness, where it tends to be hot in August. So, yeah. yeah. Oh so, I hope I can be on the porch. Yeah. Yeah, that would really be nice. Um I I don't know about the porch and next month. I, August, we're really seeing some unusual weather here and so if it was 103 yesterday, yes. I don't know about what what uh, what August is going to bring us, but and I know. But until we come back, you make sure that you stay cool. Me and um, thank you so much for leading us through um, this conversation and picking out the parallels. I mean, when you brought that up, I was like, "Where is she going to take us?" So so thank <laughs> you 
for doing that and and putting um, putting this on our minds and and giving this helps us with our marching orders on um, how we just need to be more inclusive and more respectful and considerate of everyone, not mm -hmm. just some. And yes. this is why we do the lived black experience. And so lived black experience, community, family, supporters, friends, cheerleaders, Thank you so much for joining us today for our June book club. We'll be back with our July book club at the end of the month and we'll make sure um, in the next week that we will announce um, our July book read so that uh, you'll have a little time to get caught up and to join us again. Until then, thank you, be blessed, go in grace.